first year, the, least, the episode of these Sundays, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, let us not convert evil things as they also coveted, neither become ye idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and perished by the serpents. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, he that thinks himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Let not temptation take hold on you, but such as is human. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also with temptation issue that you may be able to bear it. And now the Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time when Jesus drew near Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also had known, and that in this thy day, the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat on the ground, and thy children who are in thee. And they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them had that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. So far, the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Ghost, Amen. My dear brethren, let us admire, read, think about this beautiful text which the Church has prepared for this, for this Sunday. In fact, why? Why does the Church prepare us these texts every, every Sunday? First of all, because it is the sacred liturgy, the first purpose is to glorify God. That's the very first reason why we are here. We have to adore God, we have to worship Him, and we do that through these, these words. At the same time, our Holy Mother, the Church, wants to educate us, wants to form us, wants to teach us, to feed us, to comfort, to strengthen us, our faith, our will. And that's definitely one of the reasons why the church every Sunday brings us other, other texts taken, most of them, from the Holy Scripture. L allow me to really strongly, strongly invite you before you go to Mass, before you go to the Sunday Mass, to take the time to read, to read this text. The intro it, the collect, the epistle, the gospel, 
all the prayers. They are there for you. And I lament that we do not take enough of that time to prepare our Sunday Mass. It is not an obligation, so you are not coming to commit a sin if you don't do that, definitely. But let tell me you that you miss something. Because when we just read them during the Mass, yes, we get some graces. But if we read them before, we, we dispose our soul. We prepare it. And so when, when it happens in the Mass, we are much more, we get much more of them. And you will see something which is absolutely amazing. It is true of the Holy Scripture, but it is true of all these texts. Every time you read them, every time you discover something new. You may have read them 100, 1,000 times. You will see by reading them, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't see that. Because it's the word of God. And God is infinite. We will never, we will never, so to say, finish. We'll always find something new. Because God is talking of himself. And of course, of us too. So the thread of our thoughts for this Sunday, we take them, we take it from the collect, from the first, the first prayer we address to God today. It is a very, in fact, curious prayer. Because we say to God, praising his mercy, and we know that we, we count on his mercy when we pray to him, we ask him for something, and this time, what do we ask for? We say to him, so that we may obtain what we desire. Make that we desire what pleases you. It's clear, that's the best way to get. If we ask from God what pleases him, we'll get it. But then we may ask ourselves, but why does the church make us for such a thing? And fortunately, we will say, because many times we don't ask for what pleases God. So, what does God want? What pleases him? Definitely what he wants for us. So what does he want from us? We hear it from the Holy Scripture. Saint Paul is describing us something which is marvelous in fact. He tells us before the constitution of the world, that is, before creating the world, he has, God has chosen us in his son so that we may be saints, holy. Why did he create us that we may be holy saints before him, before his sight? In another passage, God, through the apostles, tells us this is the will of God upon you. Your sanctification. What do we mean when we say saint? God is saint. 
we hear from the prophet, also from St. Paul, who have been able to have a glimpse into heaven. What did, did they hear? What did they bring us back? These words, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. What we sing just after the preface, that be before the canon of the Mass, Holy, Holy, Holy. God wants to share with us His holiness. In other words, he wants us in heaven. He wants to share with us all his perfection. He wants to communicate to us his own beatitude. That's why he has created us. That's what he wants from us. That was pleases him. Definitely, then, it must be what we have to ask for. And what do we ask for? Where are our preoccupations? Where are our desires here on earth? Let, let me try give you one or two images to help us to find that. And it corresponds also to the, to the epistle of today. St. Paul is talking to the elected people, the Hebrews, the, the Jews, they were chosen my God, that's my people. And in these people, you will have the Messiahs, the, the Redeemer. And so to say, to be a Jew, and the Jews were very, very conscious of that, I am in the right train. This train goes to, goes to heaven. So I'm saved. And, well, St. Paul says, this has been written for us. What happened to the Hebrews in the desert? So many unfaithfulness. And each time, God is going to scorch them, to punish them. So, in other words, it's not sufficient to belong to these chosen people to be saved. We could say like this. It is um, an example which we take from the virtue of hope. When you go into hope, the hope gives you a certainty. And this certainty is to get there. In my hope, bending myself on this promise of God, I am certain that I'm going to get to heaven. It's like I go into the train, it's written, I don't know, let's say I'm in Washington and the train says New York, so I know that if I go into that train, I will get to New York. Of course, it is a, a human certainty, but it is a moral certainty. People who want to go to New York would not step in that train if they would not be sure that it goes to New York. Imagine someone, he is waiting on the platform, and he says, hmm, this train, I'm not sure that it goes to New York. I want to go to New York, but I don't know. Let's have a try. No, nobody does that. You first ask, is that really the train that goes to New York? And then you step in. So with the faith, 
We know to be saved, we need to be Catholic. So let's jump in that train. It's the only one who goes up there. Can we now just slip in that train? You say, okay, anyway, the train is bringing me to heaven. It should be like that. But in between, there is what we call the original sin. And the original sin has caused in us a havoc. And this havoc is... We could call that distraction towards the end. I want to go to heaven. I am a Catholic. I want to honor God. I want to be saved. That's true. And God is giving us, is imposing on us that end. But then he makes us free to choose the means. To get there. And in the choice of the means, I may say that's where we have a problem. Look at our Christian life. We know the end. We know where we want to go. It makes sense that the best way to go there is a straight way, like kind of an arrow. You point, you shoot, and the arrow goes straight in a straight line to the end. That's how our life should be. Once again, how is it in reality? Let's be honest. In these choices for the end, so many times we are so fascinated by the means we choose that we, we stay there. We remain in the means. And, and we forget about the end. Something like that. I need milk. I'm here, so I need to go in town to get that milk. So, to get there, I need means. I would say, man will be distracted. Okay, to go there, I need a car. Oh, I want that car. That blue car. God, give me that blue car. I need that blue car. I forget about the milk. I want the blue car. For ladies, it could be, I need to go in town, so I must be well dressed. So I need a new dress. Oh, I want that dress. And so we lose ourselves in these things, we see at them as the most important thing of the moment. And easily, easily we forget about the end. And unfortunately, we are like that. That means our desires, they become more and more stronger when we go into details. That's our sensitive life. If you have an idea of New York, yeah, it's a big town, so yeah, let's go there. If you know in that town there is a cathedral, I want to see that cathedral, I want to see that altar. You can see by yourself, your desire is much, much stronger. We are like that. We, know, we need to go into these details. It's not just about the means, it's also about the end. 
And that's why the church is insisting, telling us, you need to know God. Don't remain in a kind of blurry idea, yeah, God is great, God is infinite, he's my creator. Go much more into details. God wanted, God was invisible because he's a spirit. He wanted to give us someone concrete, Jesus, God made visible, made flesh, made human amongst us to draw us. And that's why also the church wants throughout the year to go through all these details of his life. Because each one is telling us something about God, about our Lord. And the more concrete we become, the more we will be able to desire and to love and to love God. Think about that. Take the time. From time to time, think about all what God has done to you, for you. You can base yourself on these words of St. Paul, what do you have that you have not received? Look at all the qualities, all the talents which you find in yourself. Thank God, don't go into pride because of that. Remember, God has put that in me because he loves me. So what should I do to love him back? Another idea in the same direction. God put in us a virtue. This virtue is called charity. Do you realize that the charity tends towards union? When we love, we want to become one with the beloved. So God has put in us this virtue of charity. And he has even made us a commandment, which is above all the commandments, which is the summary of all commandments, that we love him with all our heart, all our strength, all our spirit, that we really put everything in that, in that love. But there's something we may not realize enough the charity which wants this union is going to direct to orientate it all all our energies toward God everything we do even if we don't think about it. If I go back to the dress, if I go back to the car, I may need these things. And as long as they allow me to get to my milk, it's okay. Of course, I should not stay in these things. They are means, so I use them as long as they are means. And that's it. They are not my end. But if I need a dress, if I need a car, let's take it. No problem. That's why God is pouring us around us so many things. Let's use them for the purpose. That's the difficult point, to keep it at the right level, to not exaggerate in these means, but precisely the virtue of charity is the one which is going to dictate how much 
of these earthly means I need, I need to desire to get to my purpose and to keep me focused on the purpose. That's why the first thing we have to ask to God and all the time is to love him. He made it a commandment. In other words, that's what he wants. So let's start by asking him for that charity. We cannot by ourselves grow in the grace. We need him. He will do that. So let's ask him for it. First of all, and above all, let's ask him for this virtue of charity. Everything will be put in order when I start to give to God the first place. And necessarily, since the original sin, since this havoc creating us, which we call the wounds of the original sin, we need to renounce. To renounce to all or so many of these earthly things, which we imagine they're absolutely necessary. And if we reflect a little bit, well, Maybe, but not absolutely necessary. One thing is necessary. One thing is important. And it is God. God is using another way for us. I'm going to finish with this, and we see that in the gospel. Because, because of our rotten desires, because of our horrible way to go in all directions. In fact, if I go back to the idea of the straight line to heaven, if we look at our lives, the line we follow is the one of the butterfly. Try to find a straight line is the fl in the fly of a butterfly. What does the butterfly do? Oh, there's an interesting flower there, and there too, and there, and, and there, and there. And so you see this poor butterfly fly like this. If we do not apply modification, discipline in our desires, in our hopes, that will be our life, the life of a butterfly not of an arrow. So that's why we need to, we need to do a lot of these mortification. Of course, prudently, sanely, keeping in mind, I need these things, but for my end, to go to God. There would be other thoughts in today's text, I invite you to look at the secret, which is the prayer at the end of the offertory, which is a marvel. To look at the communion, which is this prayer, which we pray, the post-communion, which we pray after the communion. They are marvelous. The one in the secret, we say to God that every time we celebrate the commemoration of the host, of the victim. The redemption is operating. That means every Mass, we are at the, at the foot of the cross. And all these fruits of the redemption, of our Lord redeeming us, they are repeated. The best thing we can do in our life, attend Mass, 
We are at the foot of the cross. We are at Calvary. And God wants that so that we may benefit again and again from all these fruits of Calvary to be saved. And in the post-communion, we speak of one of the fruits of the communion, which is unity. It's something we may forget. Of course, when we say communion, we become one with Jesus. It, he said it, you in me, me in you. But there's something we forget. And St. Thomas is telling us this very precisely. He says that the fruit of the communion is the unity of the church. You have heard well? The unity of the church. Why? What is the church? The church is the mystical body of Christ, which means it's our Lord who is incorporating, embodying the souls with him. We become one body with Christ. That's the church. And then it's not just each one individually, but it is also in all direction. We all become one with Christ. And you have an indication of that even in the matter, in the bread, in the wine. How do we get bread? How do we get wine? You take a multiple grains, seed of wheat, grapes, an enormous quantity of them. They are pressed, so much pressed at the end, they become one. One bread, one wine. But it is produced out of a lot of things. So the church. And in this prayer, we indicate very, very smoothly, but we indicate this, this truth. This truth. The word communion has a sense. Not just communion with Jesus, but with the church. And that means also that what matters, what happens in the church, does not leave us indifferent. We cannot say, forget them. They want to go that crazy way. I have nothing to do with them. Forget them. We cannot say that. It hurts us when we see the church suffering. Imagine how much our Lord suffers when he sees his church in such a situation. So let's, let's go to him from whom we receive everything. Let's go through the Blessed Virgin Mary, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Let's ask, beg God to give us, or first before giving, to put in us the real desires, the true ones, those which please him, that he may put in us these true desires, so that when we pray, we ask God for what pleases him, and then that we may receive it. At the end, it will be to be with him for all eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.